The medium that I've used the most over the years is watercolor, and as somebody who likes to, to try to capture those ineff ineffable qualities of in nature, uh, the fleeting colors of fish or birds, it seemed like a, a good medium to choose. It's, it's, there's a lot of possibilities. You can, you can use it very transparently or more opaquely. Uh, so I, I've grown very comfortable with, with that medium. I think I've always been interested in that friction between the real and the imagined. When I'm trying to depict nature uh, as accurately as possible, I'm still using quite a bit of imagination to, in my interpretations of, of, of these creatures. So part of my interest in a lot of my work is how much of what we're seeing is, is influenced by our perceptions and, and is clouded by the way we communicate language and how language shapes our perception. I, I love language. Without it, we wouldn't be able to describe the diversity on the planet. But it also has great limitations. I'm working on a book called the, the Beauty and the Failure of Names because I love language, but when we try to communicate nature, we're losing a lot because, as I mentioned before, nature is fluid and continuous and constantly changing, and we have to chop it up into units. So we, but we also have this powerful tool in language beyond just names and words that we call metaphor sometimes. And embedded in some of these names for these creatures are these kind of beautiful metaphors, like sailfish is almost like a, a kind of a metaphoric name because it, the sailfish, the actual fish, has this beautiful big dorsal fin that looks like a sail. So I, I guess I was kind of playing with these names by, you know, I replaced that sail-like dorsal fin with, with a wing, which is also kind of sail-like. So I sort of, with the imagery, kind of maybe changed slightly, or, or through making a literal depiction of what the name says, maybe force people to think about the fact that we don't have to be um, shackled by the people who name these things necessarily. I began painting these hybrid creatures after two decades of um, painting the diversity of trout around uh, North America and Europe and Asia and North Africa, years of travel in remote places. Why I became interested in, in painting trout, I, I mean, how do we ever justify our, our passions really, but um, for some reason I became really obsessed with this beautiful fish that lives in cold water wildernesses around the world and it was a good excuse to travel and see different places. But there was a certain point at which I'd, I'd done these two books of, of paintings on trout, painted hundreds of, of different fish from different parts of the world, and I came to a point in my late 20s where I wanted to say more about our relationship to nature and how it's changing. And through the, the work on the trout, I sort of developed this inquiry ab about how we divide a nature that's fluid and continuous and constantly changing into discrete boxes in order to describe and communicate them. Because uh, in particular with trout, when you're trying to depict the diversity, it's not clear where one species ends and the next begins. And I started to have trouble even with this term species. So the, the first hybrid painting I made was a, a literal depiction of a parrotfish, this reef fish. I painted literally the head of a macaw, a parrot, and the tail of a fish. So I started making these literal depictions of, of creatures that became their name almost in protest of humans trying to control them with their minds through language. So that's how it started and then it became a lot more things. Also, you know, what's nature's capable of creating anything and some of these things actually could be plausible. Part of the reason I love painting so much uh, is that it's always challenging and there's always, you can always push the technique the, and you can always learn just from, from looking at other paintings. I'm, I'm always kind of amazed that painting hasn't really changed that much, the, the basics of it in a hundred thousand years. I mean, they recently found these these clamshells with pigments in them that people were using to, to, make, to make paints, uh, they think, 100,000 years ago. And we're still grinding pigments and suspending them in a medium and slathering it on some surface. The surface may have changed, the medium may have changed, but the technique is the same. Using animal hair brushes in this world of crazy technological advances, the fact that I can still make a living 
with this very primitive method of making a picture is, is amazing. Why is it still relevant? I, I don't know, but it, it seems to, to continue to be. Um, and I think the less novel the technological stuff becomes, the more important the, the individual and handmade stuff will become. And, and, and you dragging a pencil across the paper or um, painting something is, I think, will always be relevant. It, it reflects the, the movements and the thoughts of an individual person. And there's nothing else that can really do that as well.